Welcome and thank you for listening to The Civic Space today with Southern Defenders, a podcast that explores the status of the civic and political space in the Southern African region. We unpack critical issues that shape the space. My name is Mandata Nloja and I am your host. On Sunday, February 4, the president of Namibia, Hage Gengob, succumbed to cancer and died at the age of 82. The nation and others outside continue to mourn President Gengob and reflect on the legacy of his leadership. In our episode today, we join the people of Namibia and are excited to host Esther Simon, a phenomenal young woman who served the president as his youngest advisor in the high-level panel on the Namibian economy. We hope to learn more about the president's youth focus and the experiences of youth leaders in various capacities that got to serve in his tenure. Esther, our sincere condolences, and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, thank you very much, Mantate, and uh, it's an honor to be with you on this uh, podcast this evening. In all our episodes, we ask our guests to define themselves. So who is Esther Simon? It's a tricky question. Um, profoundly, probably, I would want to identify myself as a youth leader uh, without any boundaries, very um, articulative in the space of education, served as a president of the National Students Organization, um, served at continental level with the Southern African Students Union, continental level with the Pan-African Female Youth Leaders as the president, and currently with the Global Campaign for Education as a board member representing youth and students. And to bring it closer to home and to the topic that we are looking into today, I um, had the honor of working with our, it's still very so difficult to even refer to him as the late uh, President um, Hage Gengop um, on his economic panel, just the high level panel on Namibian economy as uh, the youngest advisor. So ideally uh, that wraps up in terms of who I am and uh, the work that I'm passionate around the space of education. Much more could be said, but I think I'd want to leave it at that for now. Thank you so much, um, Esther. So interestingly, you just literally dived into my question that was coming up to this, because I was going to ask you to say, was the president to you and in what ways did you get to interact and work with them? You already referenced that you are his youngest advisor and the high level panel on the economy. Maybe give us a bit of detail in terms of how did you get into that space where you begin to work with him in that panel? What was the journey to that and what did that advisory role entail? All right. Uh, well, firstly, uh, maybe I'd like to, to bounce back to my Tenya is the first female president of our National Students Organization, which is uh, known as the Namibian National Students Organization. While I was serving with Nanso as the president, um, I had a very important um, sort of resolution which we took, which uh, spoke to access to quality education, but we identified it to be free education. Now, as we went on to do those campaigns, we had media engagements and so forth. One interesting morning, I just received a call um, that the president wants to see me. I actually thought it's a joke because not just anyone out of the blue, you receive a call and their state wants to see you. Um, upon arriving at State House, um, I was informed that the president wanted to appoint me or rather has appointed me on the high level panel. Um, and I just needed to receive my, my letter of appointment and then engage further. Now, His Excellency believes so much in the potential of young people. And a lot of people have identified or have been describing him to have an eye for talent. He saw me on TV um, presenting on this uh, resolution that we had taken with Nanso. Um, and there's a program on our national broadcaster known as One on One. Um, and during that one on one program, um, I was having discussions around what the work of Nanso. Um, how we're trying to uh, redefine NANSO in a post-independent Namibia. And I think His Excellency just got drawn to, 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 to this young person that has uh, taken the realm of NANSO as the first female president and wanted to tap further into maybe the potential that he had identified at the time. Um, he engaged me, yes, and indicated that my role on the panel would be to be the voice of uh, young people in Namibia because now the country was on an on a journey to revive the Namibian economy, but he wanted to know um, what the views of young people in the country are, how us as young people can come to the table to also uh, have a conversation on economic recovery. 
our task on the panel um, to chair the unemployment subcommittee. Uh, the unemployment subcommittee was uh, was given to me because obviously the unemployment rate is, is very high amongst the young people, and I think it's just not the Namibian context. Uh, it cuts across the continent. But at the time, the fact that the people that are suffering from the high unemployment rate were young people has then given them mandate to say, well, we are trying to revive the Namibian economy. Uh, you are the president of the young of the young people, basically students and learners in the country. We want you to tell us what we need to do. And that really, uh, uh, Mantate spoke to who President Gengob was, a leader who was so consultative, a leader who listened, and a leader who implemented, um, and a leader who never judged based on age or gender. Uh, whether you're a young woman, he believed in your potential. Whether you were just a general young person, he believed in our potential. So he spoke or rather walked the talk by engaging and involving us. So my role generally to, to draw back to the panel um, was then to advise the president on how he could revive the economy from the young people's perspective. So I had to also go back to my constituency, grassroots uh, consultation to be informed on what I need to present during the report that I had to do. Um, profoundly, what came out from uh, submissions that I made on the high level panel was the issue around uh, curriculum reform, where we needed to speak more to practicality as opposed to theory, because uh, a lot of young people graduate, but they are unemployable. And further to also to say we need to identify ourselves with the fourth industrial revolution. We need to identify ourselves with the current demanding uh, demands within the work market. Um, and on top of that, the other submission which came through the consultation that I had with student leaders, uh, SRCs to be specific, was the issues of internship. Um, where government took a position, a policy position, to be giving 30% uh, of statements to 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 students that we're going to do internship because a lot of young people were taken up by different whether private or public institutions to do their internship but mostly has just been volunteering so that then took a little bit of a shift to say that even if you're coming in to get the experience which you so need let us also meet you halfway to give you this and it also there was another position on compelling institutions to take up a certain percentage of young people to do internships. So many, many other submissions were made, but I think those are the two uh, uh, figures highlight that came from a young person who was at the time serving the student um, organization to just really inform. Now, what stood out for me was that President Gengob didn't just receive the submissions and let it slide. He was an implementer. Um, so even if when it was submitted, through the different ministries, we started seeing uh, a, a change according to how we advise it to be done through his uh, the different national uh, um, development uh, agendas that we had through the Harambe Prosperity Plan. So many um, government policies, so many government institutions that started aligning themselves with the submissions that were made by the high level panel. So that profoundly was generally the work that I had to do. But also uh, maybe to make mention is that uh, it was an opportunity to serve, uh, but also an opportunity to learn uh, from the greatest that got to, to, to serve this nation where he sort of offered some high level of mentorship where in as much as one was giving back, um, one was also able to, to tap so much from him at that, that given opportunity. Thank you so, so much. You know, I have so many questions <laughs> before the other <laughs> questions I already had planned for you. But I think I find it very interesting and also just refreshing to just listen to you talk about, you know, where he saw you and the action you took to identify you and bring you into a space that was meant to benefit young people. But beyond that, also thinking about how you're brought into a space where you are able to go back to the young people, engage them, and then bring back their issues and their thoughts around what could be done and also seeing that translate into action. I think it's very refreshing to kind of see, you know, start from like A, B, and it's going to C. And I was going to yeah. ask you around, you know, some of those, you know, policy positions that the government took, especially the one that speaks into um, the internship for young people. Is this an ongoing um, is this ongoing and do you see it being sustained beyond um, the, the life and legacy of the president? Yes, um, it is ongoing. Um, and the 
what's even more beautiful to see is that more institutions have come on board. The private sector has started also playing a critical role. Um, public has continued to maintain the space. But the beauty is that it is still going on. Um, even the, the stipends that the young people are now getting has increased in some private sectors. The numbers have also gone up. So it, it goes to show that um, it's just not policy positions that were done to entertain the, the, the advice that came from the high level panel. But it identified key issues that were on the grassroots and ensured or enabled opportunities to ensure that after submissions of the report, um, much more is being is, is visible throughout the action that the private sector and the public sector continues to do. But not only was that the uh, policy position that um, uh, the president has taken, um, I think it speaks to so many other aspects. Um, president Gangop was a, a believer of uh, um, institutions. Um, he believed in the ability to run uh, the state freely um, and he had so much uh, policy positions on different key issues, whether it's land reform, whether it's um, anti-corruption, whether it's economic recovery broadly that we spoke about, and even youth empowerment, I think, which is the, the center. But very profound is his views um, and position on education. Um, and and when, when we reflect even on, on his own life, President Gangop is a son of farm workers. And many times he always says that it's through education that a son of farm workers is able to become a head of state. So because of his own testimony and his own life experience, he believed in the power of education so much that he ensured that when he took office, basic education became free. Um, and, and, and even the discussion around wanting to make sure that education is free until tertiary level, he believed in it, but tasked us even at the time to say, okay, if we are to make, if we are to make education free, how do we do it? What are the practical steps? Go back and do research, right? Um, and, and even throughout, we, we, we came to see that throughout budget, um, education, the education budget kept increasing. Uh, the budget that went to the um, organization, which is known as NASFAF, which is tasked to, to be the, dis the one that distributes student loans and bursaries, kept increasing. That goes to show the, the, the kind of leader that we had that believed so much in education and ensured that throughout his policies, throughout the budget, he, he put his money where his mouth was. Uh, in terms of um, corruption in the country, he was also uh, very, very adamant around it. Um, and uh, the president also made uh, fighting corruption a priority, um, introducing quite a number of measures to ensure transparency, to ensure accountability, and also just good governance. This includes the establishment of uh, the Anti-Corruption Commission, in, which was sort of a, a body that was introduced to fight corruption and ensures that it strengthens the, the, the anti-corruption legislature within the country. So we, we, we will never stop talking about the, the beautiful work that he has done as, as, as a country's president and these different um, bold decisions that he made. Around youth empowerment, uh, President Gengop has defined the odds. He broke glass ceilings. He, he had the entire nation or the entire continent, the entire world on a standstill. And for them to just twitch, twist their heads and look at Namibia, where throughout his governing structure, when he took office, firstly, what he did is throughout when he was appointing advisors in his private office. President Gengob had a youth advisor. When he was at appointing different advisory committees, I am just an example of so many other, where it's a high level panel that is advising him, um, a head of state sitting in his head of state chair, listening to a 24 year old to advising him on how he could better govern the nation around economy recovery, around how to engage young people. He throughout his tenure was the first president to ever appoint a youngest deputy minister at the age of 22. We even got to see having members of parliament at the age of 23. In fact, with his demise, we've seen the deputy minister being appointed now as a minister 
That's the legacy that President Gingob left behind, a true believer of the potential of young people. But he just didn't believe in us from a distance. He brought young people closer. He brought young people on the table and said, this is where we make the decisions. We want you to be engaged. He really gave meaning to youth engagement. Uh, so I think that's, that's genuinely what I want to, to reflect and highlight on for now. As you're speaking, I'm actually thinking how maybe we should all just migrate to Namibia. Because <laughs> it looks like there's so many interesting things happening. And I think that's very refreshing because I think um, a greater part of conversations around, you know, Africa and governance, um, there is a lot of like negative things happening and the conversations are never this refreshing. So I think I'm very excited to see that, you know, you're speaking very well of your government and your leadership and actually buying into the vision they had and also seeing how they're fitting young people into it. So I think a lot of us after listening to this episode are going to be applying for citizenship <laughs> in Namibia. So expect to start creating space uh, for all of us. But I think beyond just the excitement and the idea of us moving to Namibia, I think it's it's us realizing just how much room there is to learn from each other because I'm just looking at the way that you are doing things as a country. And mm. I can see that um, in my country, we don't have some of those things, but we also might have one or two things that might be functioning that might be useful for young people in Namibia. And there might be also young people from other countries in the Southern Africa region that could potentially be having, you know, working models that we can learn from. So I actually love that. Um, and I wonder maybe at the end, as we speak about, you know, reflections and the way forward, um, it'll be interesting to kind of get a sense of the ways that you feel us as young people um, in various capacities as ordinary young people like me and you, but also as young people that are taking up space and leadership to say, how can we tap into all of this growth and this opportunity that seem to be coming up in different countries for young yeah. people? Um, I was then going to ask you to say at a personal level beyond that appointment in the high level panel, do you see that space having created, you know, more opportunities for you? Do you think it provided you certain skills or knowledge that allowed you to transition into different spaces? And also on the other hand, how do you think your tenure, especially in that particular appointment, actually imparted other young women leaders that are hoping to take up more space and also contribute to governance processes? Yeah, no, um, it, it definitely did uh, propel me uh, for greater heights. And I think um, I, I, re I remember reflecting earlier on the fact that uh, I was appointed at the age of 24, uh, never seen before a young person at that tender age uh, serving as a, an advisor on such a high level panel to a president. But not only uh, was I pouring out from uh, the little cup of knowledge that I had or from our uh, youth centered space, but equally I got an opportunity throughout this different task because you, you you don't show up and give the president substandard work. Um, it also put a certain level of, of, of um, um, accountability on you as a leader to go and do further research, to come back with the proper statistics, be do have an informed view. So generally, then that spoke to my own growth as a as, as a young leader, uh, because now I had opportunities to go and dig even deeper uh, than what I would have normally done. Um, and also, uh, the high level panel was a, was a group of experts in their different um, industries. It's CEOs, it's prof vice chancellors of, of, of universities, is um, governors of, of, of Bank of Namibia, it's um, a, a high profile business people from the Republic. So I had a first hand opportunity to learn from the best in the industry. Um, on top of that, you now had a head of state who for me, from my own personal perspective, became a mentor. Uh, because then from that high level panel grew a relationship where I could step from his wisdom, from his rich history and his rich knowledge that he had, which now enabled me to grow in different spaces, especially around leadership and also looking at the qualities and characters that he carried as a leader that I was able to tap from. 
Um, beyond that, um, I started getting opportunities to 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 to, to grow um, in different spaces because you would get to 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 be invited in different spaces. Profoundly, not only because you are a student leader or you are serving in other different capacities, but specifically because I had the opportunity to serve on this specific um, um, panel. And I think on a broader perspective, it gave a lot of young people hope, um, hope to dream to be do, to do greater, hope to know that, well, if Esther Simon can be appointed at this level, then I too can be appointed to this level, or I too can even grow to greater heights than this. So for me, it was a reassurance um, for, to, towards the young people of the Republic and even uh, uh, beyond the Republic of Namibia to say that, well, um, the youth engagement, uh, the radical youth engagement and giving young people, as I said, the table that we are fighting for is can be a reality, it's not far-fetched. Uh, and it's possible, we can achieve this because it is achievable. So it was some sort of reassurance to the young people, I think, uh, who were able to tap from it as, as, as some source of hope, but also in my personal capacity, it, it brought a lot of growth. And even until date, I think it's a, an opportunity which I will hold dear for a lifetime, it was an... I love that. And I think that's just really, the, the essence of leadership, it needs to be able to provide other people the space to see people that look like them, people mm -hmm. that represent where they come from and be able to say, because that person takes up space, that means I too um, can take up space. So I actually love that. Um, I was going to ask you as well, what were some of the biggest challenges and rewards? Uh, I, I think on the rewards part, you kind of already spoken about the rewards of working closer with the president. But what would you say were some of the challenges that may have come with that um, encounter? It could be challenges at a personal level to say, how did you show up and find yourself measuring up for the task? But also you mentioned that you went back to young people to engage them. What were some of the challenges associated with the work that you're doing and potentially just with working with the president? This, this goes back to, to the conversation around age um and the experience and the knowledge um where the president sort of um throws you into the deeper sea and tell you well swim let's see how you will survive um and i think i, I would just not speak from from my own context being being appointed on, on the high level panel and given such huge national duties uh but i'd want to speak to 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 also to include how Many a times, as young people, um, when we when we speak about the need to be involved, nothing for the youth without the youth. Um, it also goes that there is an important aspect that we need to consider it always, and that goes back around the experience, around the know how. Yes, in our own right, we 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 sometimes identify ourselves to have the experience measurable according to our ages. But sometimes you're given such a huge national mandate uh, that you're just not only speaking for yourself as a young person, you're not only speaking for your constituency, for example, the students, uh, given the context that I was coming from, the, the, the student activism background. Now you are told to say, well, this is the crisis at national level. We want the voice of young people to feature here. But as a Simon is an individual, cannot collectively speak alone for the young people without consultation. So the biggest challenge was for me to be able to gather uh, the thoughts um, and views and opinions of other young people, because as a representative at such, at such a level, um, would me, it would be me doing an injustice if I was to only speak of my own thoughts and my own views. Uh, I needed to have that consultative and con consultative approach to ensure that when I really do speak, I speak the views and opinions of the majority of the young people that I sort of serve to represent. Um, secondly, is that um, why quite not a popular uh, um, a view where it says age comes with experience. Honestly, it does um, sometimes. And I would want to say, as a young person at the age of 23, um, given a mandate to say, we want to revive the Namibian economy, how do we do it, right? Uh, my background is not economics, my background is not finance. I'm coming much more from a linguistic perspective, literature, communication, law. Now you're given figures, it's numbers. So even 
I had to go an extra mile to do research and understand the language in the room. When we are talking about um, much more financial terms, how can I relate it in my own context as a young person to say, oh, okay, uh, from my point of view, I think this and this is doable in this context. So the challenges that I experienced was around um, 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 the, the experience not matching up, but I think I had to pull up my socks. And, and that's also what comes with leadership, the ability to go the extra mile to show up fully um, and being able to not underrepresent, but to represent to the best of your capabilities. So the second um, challenge maybe really was around gathering the, the broader constituency perspective on key issues that I needed to speak to. Now, coming from a, a much more um, religious background, or even let me, let, let, me, let me use the notation of culture, where the young person you sit and you listen to the uh, elder, elderly person speaking to you. Now, it also comes to challenge you, the little cultural beliefs that you are instilled in, or that you are brought up with to say, now you are the chair of, of the subcommittee. You have your pro vice chancellors, for example, as your secretary, and you need to instruct them to say, well, I need you to take minutes. I need you to respond to me. I need you to get me statistics on this and this and that. Um, but again, it goes to show that it's it's some level of grooming where you, you sort of needed to, to break through that shell um, and, it, and be able to, 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 to respond to a task uh, or, is, or rather to, to respond for duty. Uh, so it, it, it brought challenges which were also very um, easy to deal with, but it just needed, it, it, it needed the, will, the willpower um, and the drive and the zeal to, to, to want to show up fully for me to be able to, to attend to these challenges. So I think from a broader perspective as young people, most of the times when we maybe go out and in our activism spaces, fight for this uh, um, spaces, demand to be in the room, we also need to know that it comes with the responsibility to go an extra mile. It comes with the responsibility to represent, to show up fully and not to underrepresent. It comes with the responsibility to understand the accountability aspect that comes with serving at such magnitude. And I think um, our activism should always be accompanied by the willpower to show up fully. Thank you so much um, for just being honest um, on that part, because I think it's it's a challenge to all of us as young people as you continue to push for more youth representation, particularly in the governance space at a high level. I think it's very important that we learn from just your experience to say, even when we step into spaces that are not familiar to us, how do we challenge ourselves to grow, but also how do we tap into all of the other young people in the different spaces that have potentially the expertise or the skills that we don't have in order to feed into the work that we're doing so that we produce um, quality work. So we definitely love that. I was going to say that, you know, um, the legacy of African presidents or presidents just generally has always been contested. I, I remember someone posted something on Twitter. I think it was on the morning after the president passed away where they were basically saying that from experience, because they're coming from Zimbabwe and they had a very contested um, legacy of the late Robert Mugabe. So what she was saying was that, um, you know, with African presidents, half the time, the young people outside don't have a clue about, you know, the reality of the leadership within the country. But also you might find that as others celebrate outside, some young, like young people within the country don't see what those people are celebrating, but also as young people celebrate, because I think that's the spirit from you guys where what we've heard so far from you is a celebratory spirit, young people that have seen the president champion, you know, the youth mandate. And then for people outside, they might not be seeing the same thing. So do you think that the aspects of the president's legacy that are potentially contested outside or misrepresented outside? Yeah, um, they, they are, uh, Amantate, and I think, uh, with with the, there's so many different agents um, around our own context. Uh, you'd find some who I personally would want to identify with as enemies of progress. 
Um, and before I answer in detail uh, this question, I would want to have a general holistic view on Africa as a continent, where many a times we find ourselves in, in, in rooms, especially if you are well exposed, where the notion of what Africa is, it's, it's always far-fetched from what Africa really is. Because what we do is we enable so much space and so much room for people to define who we are, for people to define what our continent is. You, you would have you would have people having general generic views of how we deal with our issues, of what Africa looks like, of how this whole entire continent can be crafted into one country. And, and, and holistically, I think it calls upon all of us as Africans to redefine that notion, to come out more boldly to define who we are. And I think it's the same with President Gangop where in a context to a larger extent, we've had also so many different infiltration, infiltration in the country, um, whether it's deliberate or not deliberate, whether it's uh, politicized deliberately or not, I can't contextualize that. Uh, President Gango was a believer of uh, freedom, freedom rights, um, a press freedom, where he, a journalist in our country particularly, were never confined on how they should identify with his leadership um, and many a times there was so many misrepresentation of who he is whether in his own character as an individual whether as a head of state uh, and a leader of our country and it, it, it it's not new um, leadership comes with so many uh, different attacks from different levels but to be more concise I think as young people in our own context, um, many young people in Namibia knew or until now know who President Gaiankop is. Uh, we've identified with his leadership from different aspects of life. Him being a leader that could potentially never judge based on color, based on tribe, based on creed, based on religion, and even age or gender. He identified with us as young people, even on social media, easily accessible, easily uh, relatable, but most profoundly the ability for him to tap into our world as young people. Now, our world uh, or our current generation, um, it's, it's the aspect where it's not the easiest, right? Um, and, and I think it's not the easiest generation to tap from because we don't have a sort of identified generational agenda we don't have a generational mission you know our our uh, our forefathers um and with president gangop included in, in terms of, of 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 leaders that came before uh, an independent continent they had a, a sort of a collective generational responsibility agenda and mission theirs was to liberate uh, their nations and they collectively worked together to ensure that they liberated their nations. Now, ours, it's quite not very clear. Um, some feel the need to, 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 to fight for access to quality, free, relevant education. Some feel the need to fight for social progression, some around uh, sexuality, some around peace and security. So why am I zoning this in a broader context is to bring it back to the question of identifying with who he was as a leader, most profoundly as young people in our own country. Um, and I would want to, to zone that because there are some, honestly, that are zoned off from the broader picture of what's happening. And there are also some, uh, which I would want to contextualize as the majority, who really are engaged, involved and understand and for those that are involved in, in engage and understand, have a broader picture of who he was and celebrate his legacy, celebrate his leadership, celebrate the principles and characters that he stood for. But bringing in a little bit of the global view or the general outside view and how many a times there's always a co co coincidence um, attempt to sort of drive a little bit of a different narrative as opposed to what is really on the ground, um, which many a times is encompassed with how media tries to project somebody. Uh, this is where you'd find a little part of few young people unable to draw really from who he was because there is an outside view. 
there is uh, media that is trying to paint a picture which in my context isn't necessarily how it was sometimes it's even just a headline mandate which you have a completely different headline when you read the newspaper article it says completely the opposite of what the headline was and you'd find that some young people would go and read the article some would just read the headline and they would leave it as such and i really 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 so many times i've seen how president gangop has been misunderstood uh because there was uh, a certain pushed um notion to sort of misrepresent his persona but the beauty um, uh, um is that the broader picture of who he was uh subsides and overrides the little uh, small uh, uh, narrative of wanting to to maybe not have him reflected as 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 a original statement that we had who was a leader of the people and even now with 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 he, with us losing him has gone to show how much he was loved has gone to show what it means for him to be a people's president president gangop is loved by his people president gangop is appreciated by his people so many young people youth and old black and white male and female child all the elderly people everyone is so touched because we believed in his leadership we believed in the vision that he had for this country and even those that possibly didn't see the impact now are starting to realize what we have lost thank you so so much um esther i i, I can see the passion you know uh for, for for his leadership and i think it's very interesting in the sense that um you are speaking so well of the leadership um in a context where there isn't so much of this positive energy around leadership and this is not to say that um young people are not having different experiences because there could be young people um out there that are not having you know good presidents or good governance um mm. so it's very interesting to actually listen to someone that has something very positive to say about um the leadership and i think there are two things that you mentioned that i want to really highlight because i feel like it's something that resonates with how i've been thinking about the continent in my country recently but also something that we really need to think about not just as young people the first one was just a reminder that africa is not a country and mm -hmm. there is a tendency to have an outsider narrative that kind of shapes how the continent is viewed and a greater part of that is our governance is not strong we have bad leaders and things like that and in as much as we have different experiences that might be similar or different i think you were right to say that there is need for us to champion the narrative or to lead on the framing about our countries about the continent because it's not an entirely negative continent i think just listening to you and the experiences that you're having it's beautiful to see that there's so much light in in all of the darkness that is often painted so i think it's a good reminder that africa is not a country and then the second thing that you spoke to that I wanted to respond to was the the concern around young people not having a defined generational mandate, um, especially compared to people that, for instance, were in the liberation movement, where it was easier to think about. Not even easier, but it was more like we had this collective sense of we are colonized, we want to liberate ourselves. So that was like a, a collective mandate. I always like to think about it this way to say, um, when we look at ourselves as young people today, picture a puzzle and think of the fact that all of the things that all of these young people in different spaces want are pieces of a puzzle. So the mandate is there, but I think what is missing right now is a space or a process that brings us all together to actually fit in the pieces. So you find that one piece is Namibia defining itself and saying, this is what we want, right? And then Zimbabwe doing the same thing, South Africa, you know, Nigeria, Ghana, and then when we come together, you know, in, in, in our different ways, having defined what we're looking to see happen in our countries and the, the continent, I think it's us just finding ways to fit the pieces together. What's happening right now is the pieces are everywhere. The reason why I look at it that way is because I think it's very important for us as young people to honor the fact that it might not be cut out to say we want to liberate ourselves from colonial movements. But there's so much we want to liberate ourselves from. There's so much that we want to grow our countries to, the continent too. The difference here is how do we come together and find places where the pieces that we carry actually fit. So we do need a generational mandate. We have pieces of it. We're just needing to find ways to put it together. So 
I think that's very important. And then the last thing I'd say too, but there's something else that you mentioned that I think is very important is just the the need for us to go beyond the headlines. Um, I've seen the same thing where you see a headline that says something totally crazy. Sometimes it's just this clickbaiting where people want people to get excited about things, but when you get inside, it's a totally different thing. So it's very important for us to begin to engage with you know news articles in their complete uh, in their complete in their complete sense. And then be able to then, you know, provide our critical analysis beyond just that headline. So that was very important. But I wanted to also just ask you to say, um, as you know, Namibia moves forward. What are some of the most pressing issues? Maybe not too many things, just maybe three of the most pressing issues that you feel the nation needs to address, especially after the passing of the president. And how can young people be involved in finding solutions? All right. Uh, no, I think as a country, um... We are still in a state of shock, um, but what was beautiful to see is the smooth power transition. Um, it has gone to show how stable um, our country is and as young people. I mean, we, we, we were all uh, amazed and we're in, in awe of, of, of the stable leadership that we have in the country. But I think moving forward, um, we need to to regenerate ourselves and, and, and really identify common positions on how to proceed forward. President Dangop had uh, a vision of prosperity, of a prosperous Namibian house. He fought so much around um, inequalities. He believed so much in the ability for social progression, um, social uh, quality, uh, where inequality didn't have space for, 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 for his um, governance. Um, he established institutions. Um, he was very key and exact on policies. Um, and I think as a, as, as a nation, we, we need to, to rally behind the vision that he had for this country and ensure that it does uh, uh, materialize, uh, which is very, very possible and feasible. Um, I think we've seen issues around political stability as a nation that for me is, 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 is it's, it's it's without saying that it's commendable. Um, the smooth transition, I think, as young people, we, we need to, to forge forward uh, and ensure the stability of our country, or whether it's within the small contexts that we find ourselves that can escalate to, to, to a broader picture. Uh, the, the country may need also to navigate uh, potential um, political stability at the, at, the, at the larger scope because this is an election year uh, for us as a country. And I think uh, it calls, it goes without saying that as young people, um, we need to also re-energize ourselves around the importance of voting. Um, and also whether we, we, we have issues that we feel need to be addressed, identifying parties that have manifestos that speak to this. I think it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's important throughout the scope of the year, we have sufficient time to ensure that we, we, we bring ourselves closer to these different manifestos that are presented. We are able to identify our issues as young people and which party addresses and speaks much more closer what it is that we need to ensure um, around economic development. I think uh, as young people, we also need to start finding ourselves and fitting ourselves into different spaces that ensure the uh, um, economic development of the country. I know this uh, is unfortunate times um, where some might have lost hope, where some might be faced with a lot of uncertainty in terms of what to do. But for me, I think there's still so much hope. Uh, we need to hold on. Uh, push forward, and we do not need to lose that zeal nor that power now. Um, yes, it might be difficult, especially if it's an unemployed young person that has maybe graduated many years ago, uh, but it, it, it really calls upon for you to tap in the inner strength that you still have to see, to try and, to find, try and find means on where to zone yourself. I think I would want to use the example you've made, uh, finding the little piece of the puzzle that you can fit in um, around social inequality, around um, land reform, around corruption and governance. And I think the reason why I'm mentioning some of these key issues is because it's, it 
speaks to the legacy of His Excellency. And I would want us as young people to carry forward the torch of what His Excellency stood for, the good governance that he brought to the table, the different exact and adamant and bold uh, policy positions, policy directives that he brought in throughout his government, and maybe also at the broader level, issues around regional um, integration, issues around uh, international solidarity. I think it's 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 so broad, um, but just to zone it closer, um, it's to ensure that we do not sleep on the clock. We should vividly be present. Uh, but also be able to find means on how to contribute as young people. This is our country and it calls on all of us to be to be present citizens because if there's a missing part of the puzzle, then I think that's where we might miss and go wrong. Mm -hmm. um, just in summary, maybe to reflect uh, from a governance perspective, I think a sort of advice is to push for governance that emulates uh, who President Gangop was, especially who he was to the young people. Throughout many of our youth tributes, everyone kept saying that we've lost our friend. We want to perhaps guide that the leaders that are currently serving in the country, maybe at, at the continental level, should redefine their relationship with young people, should start seeing the potential that many um um, other leaders uh, to be more concise, like President Gankop saw in young people, start trying to emulate, ensuring that they give young people the possibility and the responsibilities to also contribute at the highest level of governance. We are capable, we are able, and we are ready. They need just to trust us. President Gankop trusted us, and I think it calls upon all other leaders to trust the young people and give us an opportunity. This entire conversation has been extremely empowering and very insightful. It's very refreshing to just sit and listen to someone share in a very positive sense, you know, the journey that they managed to walk with their president, but also a journey that goes beyond the life of that president to see how, you know, you can continue to build on the legacy that he leaves behind. I think it's very beautiful. It's just this powerful reminder that um, there's just so much good happening so much positive change happening. There's just so much we can learn from in as much as there's just so much as well that we can improve because in identifying all the good things, we're not very, really, we're not closing our minds and our emotions or our gates to all of the other things that are challenges. I think you did a great job of highlighting some of the challenges, even in this beautiful journey that you've been on. So it's very inspiring. And I hope that, you know, we can come to Namibia and learn a thing or two, but also hoping that Namibia can learn a couple of things from us as well. And I think that's just the spirit of this podcast, you know, creating a space where we begin to share not just the struggles for human rights defenders in the Southern Africa region, but also looking at the working models, you know, things that are helping us see that governance works and governance can work and just being able to learn um, pro from each other and apply the different things that are working in the different parts of the Southern Africa region. So I can't really add anything beyond this because you, you did such a powerful summary of today's conversation. But do you have any closing remarks that you might want to share as a way of just closing this conversation? Um, not really. Um, maybe just to share uh, closing salutations um, for our president. Um, quite a bittersweet moment uh, in difficult times. I think trying times for, for a nation which is in mourning. Um, perhaps it's just to, to, to say farewell to our head of state and ensure that maybe as, as young people from our side, we will strive our level best to continue his legacy to ensure that it doesn't die on, it doesn't die off. Um, now within the Southern African, within the Southern African context, we, we, we like making a lot of chants and I'm sure you can, you can attest to that. Um, uh, it's just that I wouldn't have an audience beyond the podcast to respond, but it's probably just to say, uh, Viva Comrade uh, Hage Gottfried Genkop Viva. Long live the undying spirit of President Hage Gottfried Genkop Long live. And may his soul rest in revolutionary power. Amen. That, that's, that's just beautiful. Um, and I really have nothing else to say on top of that. I hope that, you know, um, as a country, you know that we are celebrating with you because I think it is actually a celebration 
of a journey and a life well lived from what you've shared with us and our sincere condolences. And we hope that, you know, as young people, like you said, you continue to stand um, in the shoulders, you know, of the legacy that he leaves behind for all of you. So thank you so much, Esther, for joining us today and for this powerful conversation. And a special thank you to all our listeners. Would love to hear your feedback and thoughts on today's episode. Leave us a comment on the platform you're using to listen to this episode or tag us on social media posts. Remember to share this podcast and follow Southern Defenders on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. You can visit our website, www.southerndefenders.africa to get a broader sense of the work of Southern Defenders. This is the Civic Space Today, a program of the Southern Defenders. I am Mandatin Loja, your host for today's episode. Thank you for tuning in and see you next time. Together we defend.